If you show me that it's possible for me to do something, then I'm going to do it. You know, and if you show me it's impossible, then I'm going to want to do even more. I'll show you that. <laughs> <laughs> Go! Nobody's, nobody is what you expect them to be. Right. You understand? So the earlier you stop looking for yourself in people, then the, the easier things become for you to accept reality and other people. You understand? So for me, it's more... And avoid disappointment. Yeah, and avoid disappointment. You understand? So for me, it's more of a thing where I'd rather uh, someone who makes me feel safe, someone mm. that I can look at and I don't mm. really care, mm. <laughs> you know, if they you, you can be yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, you understand. If anybody's going to take it, myself, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> you know Welcome to this week, 60 minutes of analytical review of the big stories, topical issues and all the controversies around the world. I'm Somna Sambo. Our top stories, the road to Nigeria 2023 as the main opposition PDP backtracks says no decision has been made on zoning of 2023 presidential election. We have analysis. Give us a referendum. A group in Nigeria tells the United Nations they want help gaining self-determination. Plus, rising insecurity and kidnappings in Kaduna State, northwestern Nigeria. We take a look at the solutions to insecurity in the region. And 14 days of national mourning have begun in Tanzania to mark the death of President John Magufuli at the age of 61. The People's Democratic Party says it has not yet decided on the zone that will produce its candidate for the 2023 presidential election. It comes after the governor of Bala Mohamed led committee on the review of the 2019 general elections rattled some sections of the country by recommending that the PDP should throw open the contest for its 2023 presidential ticket. In the report, the committee recommended that every part of the country should be allowed to choose the best candidate through a credible primary election and what it says is a way of institutionalizing a merit-based leadership recruitment process for the country. The leadership of the party that we will implement this report precept by precept. All right. Uh, this uh, meeting was actually one of um, the toughest meetings that we've seen in recent times by the major opposition party where we had lots of um, top leaders of the party actually converging to hear um, the outcome of that report considering that uh, the PDP has set up a similar report in 2015 immediately after its loss to um, the All Progressives Congress and in that committee report was chaired then by a uh, Senator Iki Ekweremadu, the former Deputy Senate President, where they outlined certain strategies. But that report was not implemented until this other committee uh, that was set up after the 2019 general election when the PDP and its presidential candidate, Alaji Abubakar Atiku, lost the ticket at uh, the uh, uh, election to the All Progressives Congress. Uh, Muhammad Buhari, who is the incumbent president. And since then, there have been lots of issues here and there. And one of the issues 
um, lane before party members at this point in time is the allegations that this report may have been influenced in one way or the other uh, by certain forces within the party. And what they are saying is that uh, uh, although the party has not reached a conclusive decision on uh, whether to accept this uh, report or not to accept it, but the issue right now is that as we await the outcome of the party's official decision, we, we earlier listened to um, the voice of um, the, the national chairman of the PDP, Uche Sekondu, saying that that report is going to be implemented precept by precept. And if that report is going to be implemented precept by precept, it then means, in, uh, according to several analysts, that the PDP hierarchy has concluded to actually open up its ticket as recommended by this uh, Senator Bala Mohamed uh, committee's report. And as a result of that, this has caused uh, uproar across the country with a lot of people saying that the PDP is actually unfair, especially to the Southeast that has been agitating for the presidency and considering that the Southeast has been with the PDP since 1999 and then also, the Northeast, in one way or the other, has uh, supported the PDP in one, uh, uh, in one way or the other. It, it now looks like these two zones that have not uh, had any precedent since the return to democracy in 1999 are not being um, treated fairly by the major opposition party, which ruled Nigeria for um, 16 years until 2015, when they actually lost that election. And so this has caused a lot of opera across the country, and it now looks like uh, the PDP national hierarchy is backtracking, insisting that uh, they haven't taken a crucial decision on this. But analysts have said that with what the uh, 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 national chairman of the PDP said at that event, that it will be taken precept by precept, it now means that there's a challenge. And uh, to get more on this road to 2023, I'm now being joined by the uh, by a political strategist that is also uh, at the heart of all of these issues, both at the, AP, uh, at the PDP and some other political uh, developments across the country. Uh, well, we have Dr. Kachio Nonuju joining us at the, mon at the moment. Thank you very much for uh, having me. Yes, welcome, Thank Dr. Kach. Now, let's take a critical analysis of what the PDP is doing at the moment. It has backtracked by saying that, yes, this report was received uh, from the uh, Governor Bala Mohamed uh, Committee that reviewed the 2019 general election and the outcome for PDP, but saying that it has not taken a critical decision on it. But considering what Uche Sekundu's national chairman said that day, which we played earlier, that the report will be implemented preset by preset, how do you juxtapose all of this? I think uh, they are playing with words. Uh, the foundational principle of the PDP is the zoning of political offices. That's why its organogram and nomenclatures are all built on zoning. National Vice Chairman, Northeast, Southeast, uh, Southwest, Northwest, recognizing those diverse sub-geographies tells you that the party believes that it should continue, it is in the constitution that the rotation of power which is done to allow for inclusion is a binding principle of the PDP. But the PDP currently is challenged. A lot of the noted members of the PDP who left the PDP went to the APC and helped to bring about President Buhari. After eight years, most of them are moving back into the PDP and are the ones instigating these announcements and double speaks. The Northwest have had its shot, and now President Buhari is doing eight years for the Northwest. And uh, the same people who came to APC to bring about President Buhari, and after his eight years, are the ones undermining the party. Now you've heard that people are leaving the PDP. That yes, Bala mean, Muhammad's have, uh, paper will be the death warrant for the party if they go on to undermine inclusion. Now, there is no single ethnic group in the PDP as large as the Igbos. It doesn't exist. And if they go with so the emotions... this is targeted at the South Oh, East. yes, it is. There is a game And what makes you on. think so? I know so because you can see 
in the other side of Buhari's behavior, when he talked about 5%, he started with the scientist. Now you also now have this undercurrent. See, we've had from the Northwest, President Yeradoa, again from the Northwest, President uh, uh, Buhari. But that is of the APC. No, the that is of the PDP, Yeradoa, and APC. Of course, the APC, PDP, because in principle, those who brought Buhari to power were PDP members who moved to APC. They are now also trying to move back to the PDP. And that's why you're seeing this problem in the PDP. Yes, there are struggles at the top by leaders for control of the structures and organs of the party. And that's the reasons you've seen the schism. So there are those who want to tell the chairman, oh, I, you know, we can protect you, you can be there, you're good, you're that. Because of his fight with exactly. uh, Governor Wiki. Because of his disagreement with Governor Wiki, which started from Bayelsa. You see, Governor Wiki's thoughts were that his, his efforts towards the party would mean he would decide. But no. No matter how rich you are in Inewi, you don't own the town. No matter how much you oh, give Okay, the now let's talk of how much impact yes. this decision may have on the loyalty of the PDP members in the South. It will if kill the party. Let me, let me tell you. The, 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 the recommendation of this committee is adopted by the Apart PDP. Apart from the PDP, there is some larger reading nationally. The way Buhari has skewed a lot of advantages in favor of his people. You bring another person from Buhari's ethnic stock, he will only deepen and cement the nonsense that President Buhari has brought Nigeria to. We don't want that. We want a totally new plate so that we can equalize and bring the country back. Don't forget, when President uh, uh, Obasanjo was brought, it was to ameliorate the pains of the South. Yeah, West. but when you say nonsense, actually, these are acceptable things that the president said that he's guided by the constitution no, 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 that's and the lesson. federal character when in the his president decision. Works but, well, to let, undermine well, well, that's an issue for another time. But let's let's take a look at why the South South leaders and the South East leaders are vehement in rejecting the recommendation of this Bala Muhammad committee. Well, you now say Bala Muhammad, Bala Muhammad. The other day, a PDP member who was campaigning that foreign foreigners should bring guns to Nigeria. That tells you the mindset of uh, the report. So if but, somebody but that like... that wasn't an ethnic report. This is a report by an address major opposition what, party. What I'm trying to draw you is look at Bala Muhammad's judgments in regards to it was his, a committee report. And you, a had, committee you report. had a lot of Southerners Bala Muhammad, in that, no, listen, in that this, committee. The way it so works, it couldn't have been your opinion Whoever the chairman just is, has his views. The chairman. The chairman's views are paramount. It's like National Assembly. The man would have gavel. What he wants happens. Yeah, but I was there when the report was presented, and none of them actually raised eyebrows. On because this. that's the way the thing Meaning is. Meaning that they to support it. No, no, no. The party is watching. There are factions of the party. So it might be a faction who wants a particular agenda, and they grab that because of the current crisis in the party. And, and some people that's have said that some of those factions yes. are driven by uh, Atiku Abubakar. No, 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 it's not. If uh, the, 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 if, if the, the party the zones is ticket to the south, that yes. he will lose out. So that's why it's open-ended. No, 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 he has no. influenced you it to be open-ended. What, what do you say about people who say that? When you do party issues, Atiku should be insignificant. I think he's one of the Nigerians who brought Buhari. So you don't count his views. You look at those who stayed to build the party. Listen now. This is the way it is. Because if everybody ran with Atiku to APC to bring Buhari into governance, the PDP won't remain. Atiku has been there. We've given him polite recognition. It did not work. We fought for him. So let it go elsewhere. In line with the need to build country. Don't forget the country right now. It's challenged. All, all, all right. Uh -huh. uh, uh, we we'll just have to go on a very short break right now. When we come back, we'll continue with these issues. Uh, there's more when we return. Stay with us.
back to this week where we hold the best of conversation and analysis. I'm Somna Sambo. Well, let's continue with that um, issue you talked about, uh, Dr. Kachi. Uh, but just before then, we have been joined by uh, Barista Beatrice Koza here, who is um, uh, going to be taking a critical uh, look at some of the issues that we have to offer on um, what's going on across the country. But now let's take a look at that concluding part of what we're discussing, the PDP and 2023 and why uh, the northern and uh, the uh, southern leaders, both the south, uh, south, south, and southeast, are saying that the uh, recommendation of the Governor Bala Mohammed Committee on 2022 presidential ticket should be jettisoned. Now you were making your views. It should be jettisoned. Uh, Governor Bala Mohammed doesn't really belong to party's mainstream because he doesn't have the feelings and the thoughts of the generality of PDP's rank and file. Remember the other time, the PDP was against foreign headers carrying guns. Bala Mohammed was for it. So you can imagine... Well, we are not looking at the person no, no, of Bala Mohammed. I am trying to give you... We are you looking at a committee the that mindset, he shared. And the mindset, he wasn't the only person The mindset of the producer of that committee report. I'm just trying to get you to see. Bala Mohammed cannot be trusted to decide for the good of Nigeria when challenged. And that's why I'm trying to give you that. So his past, our reputations must always precede us and so that report he produced would not be allowed it will not fly if it does i see it as a death sentence for the party and i'm happy you're here saying you're seeing that the party is trying to re-gauge their voices this is thoughts and plots the same people who led pdp and brought buhari as president after eight years are the ones who want to come to PDP and say, give us ticket. No, it's not so. Oh, all right, let's just hold that. <laughs> well, let's go to our second story right now. There are demands that the United Nations organizes referendum on self-determination for some groups in Nigeria. The Nigerian Indigenous Nationalities Alliance for Self-Determination say they will no longer obey the Constitution. The group has declared a sovereignty dispute with the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. They will be holding a 30-day consultation with elected officials in the Middle Belt, Southwest, Southeast and South South of Nigeria. Let's just take a listen before we come. Having exhausted every democratic people driven process in seeking an orderly redress for their, first, uh, for their aforementioned grave constitutional grievances emanating from the unilateral imposition of a unitary constitutional order on a supposed federal union by a section of Nigeria that has also imposed Sharia in their own part of our supposed secular union. And now, in circumstances that have become an extraordinary emergency for our people, being confronted by the clear and present danger of extermination in the hands of our supposed com compatriots in Nigeria, who are pursuing an ethnic cleansing against indigenous nationalities of Nigeria, hereby declare a sovereignty dispute with the Federation of Nigeria as represented by the federal government of Nigeria on account of our repudiation and rejection of the post-1999 constitution of whose authorship was fraudulently imputed to us by the preamble. No formal contact was made with NINAS by the federal government of Nigeria. And so we are gathered here today, March 17, 2021, at 5 p.m., to inform our people in all our three regions, as well as the international community, what our next steps will be in our resolve to extricate ourselves from the death trap and bondage unitary Nigeria has become to our various people. And I still have with me Dr. Kachio Noduju, who is a political strategist, and by Francis Danla Dikosa, who is a lawyer, a peace advocate, and a public affairs analyst. Well, uh, let me just get your views generally on all of this. There have been agitation due to the insecurity in the country. This insecurity has made a lot of groups to actually feel isolated, and because of that, they are so angry with the country, and here we are having groups like this. What, what's your general overview of such things? Well, my, my overview, my general view is that uh, we have lived with crisis all these years. 
the crisis that we are wit presently witnessing in Nigeria does not begin with this administration. It has been part and parcel of us. And our ability to manage this crisis has made us what we are today. I personally, I don't see crisis as a big problem. I see crisis as something that would ginger you towards being better people. So this crisis to me, it, it, well, as, as uh, it may be normal, like I said, it's, it's a normal process of growth that we're experiencing in Nigeria. And that I believe strongly that we are going to come out stronger and better. Uh, when you talk about you are not going to be subject to the constitution of Nigeria and so on and so forth, I think it's out of place. Uh, the constitution of Nigeria is the ground norm. And it is the law as is now. And everybody, whether you have any problem with that law, the law as is, is what is going to be applicable. So that is my take. All right. Let's have your view, uh, Dr. Katch, on this um, uh, force, force majeure that has been declared <laughs> on the 1999 Constitution. I would say uh, President Buhari is responsible for these reactions. I, I believe what we have today are historical in proportion and scale. It's never happened like this before. We have never ever had a president who actively engages in felonious issues. Because what Buhari has done by aiding the invasion of Nigerian territory by these foreign Fulanese. Is it about Buhari or about the country? Because no, 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 before no, 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 2015, no. There were different presidents. we had don't, several governments. Don't forget so, we've had Yerado. So that, that, but we a lot of people will say that what no you're saying is a other accusation. government has ever actively aided this problem. And that's why we're saying now that you're not going to provide the security which you're supposed to, through your election, provide, people are now resorting to self-help. And when you allow a congregation of self-help activists across the country, what you have is anarchy. So I blame President Buhari for the problem. And I tell you, if he does not act now to stop this spiraling ship of state, anarchy becomes inevitably our portion. Yes, uh, in all of this, we've seen this group actually saying that they submitted a report to the Secretary of the Federal Government. Uh, they submitted a report to the United Nations. They submitted a report to ECOWAS and all of that. Even the Senate President and Speaker of the House of Representatives. Shouldn't there have been a call for dialogue by the Federal Government to ask what exactly are the grievances of this group and what is the way out? Rather, the grievances than, are very clear. Uh, this force majority has been declared. The by grievances are clear, and the force majority is in order. Why? President Buhari is the first president that acts not in embrace of Nigeria or the Nigerian experiment. No, he sees an estate where his own people should predominate. So that's why this Congress of several ethnicities have it's taken them very long to come here. Yes. And for and me, one of the issues that they actually brought that, that is really agitating all of this is this insecurity across the country. Tell us how, uh, you know, the federal government can actually create a good atmosphere for, uh, you know, groups like this to sit down, discuss, and then see how we can lead to a constitutional amendment by the National Assembly to resolve all these issues. It's not a constitutional amendment. If, you know, if a, she, a, a fish starts to rot, it starts from the head. Our problem is President Buhari does not have the honesty of a political will to allow the security services to do their job. Why are you talking Why? about Oli Buhari when, for example, there's a National Assembly and I think he wants to... No, no, to, the National you, Assembly, you want to something. it is wrong oh, of okay, you let me just have to consider view. Lawa's National Assembly. <laughs> just, just, just hold on, Dr. Kachi. He has a, a no, contribution. You you see, the point I want to stress here is that every segment in Nigeria has representations in the Senate. Including the southern uh, uh, areas everywhere. and the middle belt, which we represent. People, but we are surprised people, that the south, people, south, 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 people, east, south, west, and middle that belt we are duly are that elected, people that we are given the mandate to represent their people in the assemblies. And therefore, if there is anything wrong, if their people are not happy, uh, uh, it is their responsibility right. to defend them. All right. It's not Buhari's responsibility. We, we just have to yes, go Buhari is the president we'll, of this country. But every we, we segment... Ha, unfortunately, we have to go for a break right now. When we come back, we'll talk about these issues generally. Uh, uh, there's more when we return. Stay with us.
This week, I'm Somna Sambo. Less than a week after the Kaduna State Government released its 2020 situation report on security, armed bandits struck again. The most recent is the killing of more than a dozen in Zango, Kataf, Kauru, and Chikun local government areas of the state. It comes after the abduction of three teachers and nearly 40 students from a primary school in Kaduna on Monday, and the reported attack of the convoy of a first class EMEA in the state. The Kaduna State Governor Nasir Erufai says it is time for state policing and has called on the National Assembly to expeditiously enact related bills before it into law, which contain adequate regulatory standards and safeguards to enable state and community policing, uh, policing throughout Nigeria without any fear of abuse. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Francis Danladi Koza, who is a lawyer, peace advocate, and a public affairs analyst. Um, alongside Dr. Kachio Nonuju, who is a political uh, strategist also. Now, let's um, have your views on the, the modality is being put in place by the Kaduna State Government to actually contain this act. We were shocked as a nation when during the week pri primary, a primary school was invaded and some people, you know, kidnapped. What's the government doing and how soon should we be seeing results? Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we, have, we have seen results. We have started seeing results long ago. Uh, first of all, what the government did is to specially create a Ministry of Internal Security and Home Affairs. I think this is the first time in this country that a state government has a ministry responsible for internal security and home affairs. Now, that ministry has been given the mandate to link up with security agencies. Remember that these security agencies are not state-owned agencies. They are federal government-owned agencies. They are the police, the soldiers, and so on and so forth. These are federal government agencies. And therefore, these agencies need a link with the state government. Therein lies the importance, the relevance of this internal security uh, ministry. Now, when that was done, a lot of factors, a lot of things happened. The government on its part did its best to equip these security agencies. I want to make it clear that the Cardinal government has provided mobility for the police, for the soldiers. The Cardinal government has provided a command center for the soldiers to be able to coordinate. The Cardinal government has provided technology that will aid the arrest of any insecurity in the state. And, and that's and, why we were actually yeah. surprised when the so governor I'm, said I'm that coming. he's working with all of these people to ensure yes. that he doesn't close all the schools you, you, you in the discover, state. You that discover, except you, you discover areas that, that are what well these bandits are doing, what these criminals are doing, they are now attacking only soft targets. Soft targets, because you go to a small village where there are less security and attack and run away. And by the time the police, the soldiers are mobilized, they will run into the bush. And the soldiers will pursue them. And some arrests have been made, some kills have been done, and so on and so forth. And for the first time in the history of this country, that the Ministry of Internal Security gives an update on a daily basis of any attack that took place in Canada. We don't fear the figures. He gave the figures as to those who have been killed, those who have been kidnapped. Yes, I mean, yeah, just losing, yesterday we, so we had so one, and so, so that a lot shows, of people that, saw that shows, all those that figures shows coming that out. The state government is open. Because as far as the state government is concerned, security is not just a government affairs. Security is everybody's business. And you need this information to be able to support the government now, towards tackling this insecurity that is. Is this report that was released that a, a lot of Nigerians are interested about? Yes. This report that was released by the Kaduna State Government, how much cooperation is the state government getting from a lot of the security agencies? And how are we sure that this report will have an impact in reducing security, considering what you just said earlier, and which is the reality that a lot of these uh, security forces are not within the control of the governor? Yes. You see, you see, what is happening now is that this report is a product of consultation, it's a product of peace initiatives that has taken place, or that is even currently taking place in the state. Like, for instance, I came from the Etiap Chiefdom in Southern Kaduna. And we in that chiefdom, through the intervention of, 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 of our paramount ruler, we organized a homegrown solution to the problem. And, and, and what, what, what kind of solution is that? What, what we did was to bring all the major stakeholders at hand. And we discovered that. For the first time, we discovered that 
the narratives that are being given about the crisis, especially in the southern part of the state, are not true. When you present a picture as if the crisis is between Christians and Muslims, when you present the crisis that the crisis is between indigenous, in quote, and non-indigenous, is between one ethnic group and the other, it is not true. And that fueled the crisis in the state. So when we discover that, we say, no, this crisis is not religious. This crisis is not ethnic. This crisis is between people and criminals. And therefore, let us not see it as religious. Let us not see it as ethnic. Let the people now begin to see it as a criminal, criminal people attacking us. Is that, is that the reason why us? Governor Erufa is saying that uh, bandits should not be granted amnesty yes. just like the way because, other because state governors will be clear, We will be clear that this time around we will no longer condone any criminality in our society. So whether you are Christians, whether you are Muslim, whether you are pagan, whether you are Hausa, whether you are Fulani, whether you are Etiab, whether you are Butchu, once you commit a crime, you will be picked up. You should be treated as a criminal. Exactly. Okay, I, I want you, uh, Dr. Kachi, to talk about Erufai's refusal to actually concede to that demand by Zamfara State Government and, and uh, Governor and some other governors within the Northwest that they should actually uh, see how they can grant amnesty to bandits. Erufai insists that he is not part of that and that these are criminals and they should be crushed. Okay, these are criminals. One, these are, it's an ethnic militia. And the ethnic militia engages in criminal activity so as to achieve its objectives, which primarily is all about land. Okay? So, where if you go to Plateau, you go to Kaduna, you go to Zampara, you go to Kasena, you go to Sokoto, it's all about land. So, being perpetuated by the ethnic militia, and because of the ethnic coloration of that militia, you could see the people at the very top are very, very clumsy. Yeah, but in, in all of this, the governor for, insists that there should be no amnesty for this bandits. Why the governor is saying that he's speaking in regards to his records and the fact that he knows it. The governor has known these people for long. Remember he said something ago, he used to pay them money. So he knows them. He knows they are criminals. Those other people are looking for an easy way out. You don't pay people for committing a crime. That's one. But that does not vitiate the fact that the problem in Kaduna, all about the killings, is about land. It's an ethnic militia bent on seize taking land and using the killings as a form for ethnic cleansing of ancestral land. The government said that, we said no. The federal government has used different, different ploys to seek for that land, grazing reserve. Now, they are telling you it's not one... Uh, uh, ethnicity against foreigners. Kaduna has a lot of knock United Nations sites. You don't damage those things by removing the indigenous populations there just because you want to give land to refugees who are non Nigerians. Uh, all right, let me just come let to let you. Just, in, in, in looking at this report, one thing that actually caught my attention was that, for example, uh, uh, in uh, Kaduna North, there were 34 persons killed last year. Uh, Kaduna Central had 617 people killed. And then Kaduna South had 286 people killed. So, saying that there were more people killed in Kaduna Central than in Kaduna South and Kaduna North. North. Based on this, there were animals that were rustled. Uh, 1,561 persons were kidnapped in Kaduna Central, while 317 people were kidnapped in Kaduna South, while only 94 were kidnapped in uh, Kaduna North. Can you uh, speak to these figures? First of all, with due respect to my, my brother here, you know, he doesn't know what is on ground. Of with course, you, I do. With due respect to him. <laughs> excuse me, sir. I let's do, let's with actually with hear greatest, him out. With the greatest respect. I have farm in Brunungwa, so Kanye, why would I know? With the greatest uh, uh, let's just hear him out. Respect to him. <laughs> when he says that the crisis is land grabbing, it is not true. Now, when you go to Brunungwa, these are predominantly Muslim areas, and they have been attacked. Whose land are they trying to grab? If you go to to, to Kaduna North, just like the report says, there are crises there. So if you go to Kedansa, so which land are they trying to grab? These are criminals that are there, they are looking for money. They are looking for ransom. No, none of these kidnappers have ever said he want to acquire, occupy land. All of, when they kidnap people, when they arrest people, when they kidnap people, they will say, pay us ransom. And your governor and, and says it's not going, going to pay, pay ransom. ransom. 
And that is what is heightening the situation. But I like the governor for making that position. Because, look, just like the Catholic Church have made it, the Catholic Church has made it clear that we are not going to pay ransom to anybody who, are, who, who, who kidnapped any of our priests. Is that the reason and why if, we if, still if, have if, those students if, of, those forests, of that forestry if, institute if, still if, if on that Nigerians, If Nigerians would toy, would toy the, 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 the steps taken by the Catholic Church and Erufai, this thing will stop. Because most of these people who kidnapped, they are asking for ransom. At the moment we give them ransom, they will release the person. But some people so, have said that if it were uh, the governor's um, children that were kidnapped, ransom would have been paid. That's why you have the primary school children and then the forestry students still under captivity. If you, it were you, the, you, you the sons or daughters of prominent politicians, I'm very sure by now Governor Erufai would have done something. It's not true. Governor Erufai is somebody who cannot be pushed. He's no one who cannot be pushed about. He is a very principled governor. And he doesn't care. If you look at the antecedents of Erufai, he is not somebody that likes to play to the gallery. He maintains his position, whether you like it or not. And that's the type of person we want. Somebody who can be decisive, somebody who can be strict, and said, call a spirit, a spirit, and stand by it. And if he has said, I am not going to pay ransom, he has maintained that position. Arrest anybody, I'm not going to pay ransom. Just like the Catholic Church has said, we are not going to pay ransom. I pick the bishop, we're not going to pay ransom. Pick any priest, we're not going to go to pay ransom. And, and, and so if and Nigerians, what if they are killed? If no, well, may go, but they are so rich in peace. But they are so rich in peace. But we cannot continue like this. With due respect, life is precious. But seriously, if we continue like this, we are going to create a lot of problems for this country. I feel strongly that Nigerians should, at this moment, not pay ransom to anybody. And if we decide not to pay ransom to anybody, just like Edufai has said, I believe, I believe this crisis will reduce. Okay, now let's take a look at this uh, committee report because it's very interesting as to what uh, the state governor, uh, government said is doing. One of the things here it says is that it's strengthening the human intelligence gathering networks in critical areas to help communities to actually provide in, uh, intelligence to security agencies. How much of a success has that been? You see, the, 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 report, the report is informed by data collected from the grassroots. Information collected from the grassroots, activities that are happening at the grassroots inform this report. Take, for instance, when you talk about the number of people that have been killed, the number of animals that have been wrestled, the number of people that are under one thing or the other, the houses that have been burned. These are facts that are collected from the people on ground. Take, for instance, every crisis that took place, every attack that takes place in Kaduna State, the security agencies give report. I remember. The governor has, with the help of the federal government, set up security outposts comprises of soldiers and policemen in the rural areas. Yes, but and, and we are still having these kidnappings. I'm, I'm sorry to come, sir. These, these are information, collect this information and send them to the government and their reaction to it. The traditional rulers also collect information about what is happening in the villages and send them to the government. And they, 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 their own homegrown solution to this problem, they have sent them to government. And that informed the, the report. So to me, the report, the report is purely, at least I can say 90, 99% accurate. Now what they informed, they, they are, is that, number one, they said in the crisis, when you look at the crisis in Kaduna State, the central zone and the northern zone, the crisis there is informed by banditry, by kidnapping, and by cattle rustling. So but it's not land to, grab like uh, Dr. Kachi It is not. Well, it's it. not. It's been there. Oh, okay. It's so not, let's it's just talk about grabbing. what uh, the people do just very quick to control and fund grabbing. their so, uh, operations. They do the kidnap to gain money to fund their operation, or they have staged kidnappings, them and those who pay them. These things are... I will, what we're saying, if there is a political will at the top uh, uh, to okay. punish those who commit this crime, it will cease. Uh, all and right, because we just of have no to political go. will, it persists. Uh, all right, we just have to go for this uh, short break. When we come back, we'll continue with the conversations. Uh, stay with us.
this week where we'll have the best of conversations and analysis. I'm Somna Sambo. And uh, we'll just continue on this uh, note very quickly as we try to round off on this um, issue. Uh, Kaduna State has established a peace commission which is dealing with all the security issues and providing the way out. And one of the critical issues that we've been having in that, prob in that state is communal violence, apart from kidnapping, banditry, and all of that. How do you think that can have an impact, such, such a decision to establish a peace commission can have an impact in reducing crime, reducing communi uh, community clashes, and all of that? The solution to the Kaduna crisis is not a peace commission. It's having the political will. And that's what the governor is demonstrating? No, way. Well, listen. There's somebody at the top of the chain, and that is the power of the state to punish those who do things against the law. Now, this is it. Because I'm telling you, because before Kaduna occurred, I predicted it because I saw it also in Joss. What you have in Kaduna is a repeat of the Joss model. And why I told you is about land, the Plateau people say 55 of their villages are currently being occupied. And because they... People who hold the guns don't want an implementation of the law. Impunity continues in Kaduna. Well, this that, is the that, same that's why model. there's a peace commission, at, at least. That peace commission are rhetoric. Politicians do set up things. The important thing is punish those seen to be guilty of breaking the law in either killing citizens or kidnapping people. Oh. Don't talk about paying the money. Arrest them and proper prosecution for that to stop. Oh, all right. How is Kaduna said actually punishing those who engage in this communal crisis, engage in kidnapping and all of that? What role is this peace commission actually playing well, in bringing see, peace? First of all, the peace commission is saddled with the responsibility of enlightening people. You know, when you have crisis, people are involved. And you need to mobilize people. And when you mobilize people, into maintaining law and order. Into maintaining law and order, you are finding the solution to the problem. Now, if you mobilize people and they realize that, look, it is criminal for you to embark on any repressal killing because you are as guilty as the person who kills when you embark on repressal killing. And these are information, these are issues that the Peace Committee is working on. Trying so to what kind of punishment is being given out to well, the law is very clear. Exactly. People, that are, people so. that have been arrested have been tried. I know personally, I know personally when my village was attacked and we went and got information about the attackers and they identified the people that came to the village to attack. We mobilized the military. They went after those boys and they were being taken up. to court. They, they pick, I'm coming. They picked them up. The soldiers picked them up, arrested them, and handed them over to the police for prosecution. The issue of prosecuting investigation is not within the compliance of the criminal government. This all is right. a police matter. All, all the right. police will yeah. investigate, and if they find any evidence against anybody, then they will prosecute. All, and the police all, have all prosecuted right. some people. We just in have court. to leave this issue right now. It's good to know that, uh, irrespective of where they come from, offenders are actually punished. Yes. And uh, the police engages in the investigation, and the state government does its best through the Peace Commission to ensure that um, there's a conducive atmosphere for peace in Kaduna State. Well, let's go to the next story now. Tanzania has begun 14 days of mourning following the death of President John Magufuli at the age of 61 after weeks of speculation about his health. Tributes have been paid to Mr. Magufuli, who became president six years ago and was a vehement skeptic about the dangers of the coronavirus pandemic. His death was announced by uh, then Vice President Samia Suluhu Hassan, who said the president died of heart failure. She has made history after she took the oath of office as the country's first female president following the sudden death of John Magufuli. Well, I still have with me Francis Danladi Koza, who is a lawyer, peace advocate, and a public affairs analyst. And also still with me in the studio is Dr. Kachio Nonuju, who is a political strategist. Um, I just have to come back to you because you're from northern Nigeria. A lot of people are saying this um, uh, president, here she is, a Muslim, uh, being given the opportunity to run the country. Irrespective of what has happened, the constitution has been obeyed. A lot of people are saying that if it were in Nigeria here, we we'll have a challenge of some people, maybe some sections of the country saying that, look, she's a female, she can't be head uh, of state and all of that. What kind of strong signal do you think this is sending to African societies that democracy has come to stay? I'm glad to say that this is the enforcement of the rule of law. The Constitution provides that in the absence of the president, the vice president steps into, into office. 
And that's simple. Rule of law is taking its, its, its place. And once we allow rule of law to take its place, everything will be OK. The question of whether she is Muslim or pagan it doesn't really count. What really counts is the provision of the law, which has been respected. In Kaduna said something like that happened. When, 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 when Nemadi moved to become vice president, Yakua becomes automatic governor. The rule of law takes its place. And it's all over the place. Uh, so, so when you say in Nigeria... Uh, are you people, thinking, for example, a, anything happens in Kaduna State now, the incumbent uh, deputy governor uh, can take over without... Without any issue, will take over. Uh, uh, I am uh, it she will take uh, over. All right, because, now. Because let me tell you, it's, it's full implementation of rule of law. People bring in religion just to clown or to, to wrap up sentiment. Uh, all right. But as far as the law is concerned, the governor is absent. The, the, vice, the deputy governor takes over. The president is absent. The vice president takes over. As simple as that. What Rule kind of, of lessons do you think Rule that Tanzania is passing across to uh, the rest of the continent that irrespective of whoever it is, the constitution will be followed irrespective of religious or cultural uh, practices? It's good that you brought up this question. It's because our society is not working for anybody. That's why you asked this question. We knew what happened. Because of a lot of when Nigerians have been saying that if, it, course, was, if it was in Nigeria, Nigeria people they would have been say, saying no, that no, a woman she's a woman or yeah, due to correct. religious beliefs or things that like that. That is a fact. And I'm sure when that comes, you will have pundits come here to justify it. But because it's in far away Tanzania, we're hailing it. <laughs> it's very different. So you think that that, that cannot when be comes obtainable home. in Nigeria? <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Hey, <laughs> if it comes <laughs> home... That's when you know who. who that is. All right, we just. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think uh, uh, would you respect to uh, my, my colleague here? Uh, I, I think he's not being fair to Nigeria. Uh, he's not being fair. To, of course, Nigeria has diverse people, and but, people but can the rule express of law supreme. Must, oh, all right. So, 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 so we don't have to go to the. We're talking to about to say access what you want to say in Kaduna. That's yeah, what yeah, we're. Well, we don't have to go to the next issue now. The issue of AstraZeneca <laughs> and uh, the reports we are having is that this um, AstraZeneca vaccine uh, uh, that Nigeria is currently using to vaccinate its citizens has yes. been approved by the WHO, and it's been widely endorsed by uh, uh, countries like Nigeria and all of that, irrespective of what people have said uh, that it should be step aside. Some countries have suspended the. Who what says you, so? What, what do you have to say? I mean, some countries like Denmark suspended the use no, of AstraZeneca. No, listen, listen. It's wrong. There's nothing wrong in interrogating any report. But, of course, you know, we have up to 17 million administrations. And you're talking about maybe 30, 40, 30 to 40 people having blood clot. The advantages outweighs seriously any risk. So, so Nigerians should go out and get of the vaccine. Of course. Take the vaccine the minute you can. Let me tell you. All members of the medical community have taken the vaccine. If it is bad, they are dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> who and, are and we? We have you? no one to treat us. Of course. So are, are, you afraid? are you afraid of yeah. taking this vaccine? I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid because the highest World Health Organization, the World, the World Health Organization, have approved these vaccines. They have the technical know how to determine the viability of these vaccines. Of course. We are made up of different, what may affect me when, when I take the vaccine, maybe because of the, the nature of my system, I could have some small uh, negative impact. It's, it's normal. It's normal. Because we are made up by different types of people. And so I believe strongly that the vaccines are on route. They are good for us. And everybody should go and take it. And because what you, what, what, what COVID-19 is dangerous, deadly. What will you say, gentlemen, to our religious leaders? Because so, some people go on the pulpit and then they, away from they, they stay in their I mosque the and all day, of that. Uh, the suit and <laughs> say something. And I've got anger. Say, what is religious leaders own commenting on? Let them leave uh, it. Uh, uh, all right. I've been told we do not have enough time. I've been told that we do not have enough time right now. The vice is good. So let's people should go and take it. Francis B. Truth. Religious leaders should stay away. A political strategist and a peace advocate has joined us on the team today and also Dr. Katch Ononuju who is a political strategist. It's been good having you gentlemen talking about all these issues. Well that's it for this edition of this week from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye and thank you for watching this lively debate.